Um, we're going to be in a few different texts, but uh, I'm glad you joined me in person. I'm glad you joined me online. Um, as most of you know, right now our church is going through a message series during our weekend services entitled Heartbeat, Seven Values for a Healthy Church. Uh, due to the winter weather just a few weeks ago, we had to shift some things around, um, which is why I'm a dis I am discussing a piece of this series tonight in prayer meeting. Um, that said, I, I do like prayer meeting um, to take on a distinct feel from the weekend services. I don't like it to feel like another weekend service in the middle of the week, um, which has led me to treat this sermon a little less formally, and we're going to skip the PowerPoint, we're going to skip the sermon notes and the usual preaching outline. Um, this is a topic that I actually speak about a lot. In fact, it's what the entire sermon series is built off of. Um, in fact, we actually talked about it in the blog this week, if you're subscribed to the blog. Um, but I, I just want to speak um, what the Lord's putting on my heart for this certain topic. Um, tonight we're discussing our fourth church value, which is committed community. Committed community. In an age of hostility, we declare our commitment to one another. In a culture of you do you, look out for yourself, we declare our commitment to one another. In a society that is deeply divided over mostly trivial matters, we declare our commitment to one another. I have a few texts I'm going to share tonight, but the first is Psalm 133. Um, you're welcome to turn there if you'd like. It'll be somewhere right near the middle of your Bible. We do have Bibles underneath the seats if you're in need of one tonight. Psalm 133. Uh, let's see if I can get there. There we go. Um, psalm 133 is a short song. It's actually written by King David and later used as a song of ascent. The song of ascent, uh, the, sorry, the song of ascent songs of ascent rather uh, called by some the pilgrim songs were songs that the jews would sing as they would ascend the high hills toward jerusalem for one of three different festivals each year um, these songs were very treasured by the jewish people but tonight i want to read one of those um, it's it the songs of ascent include everything from psalm 120 uh, 120 to 134 we're going to read psalm 133 so you should have turned there by now. This is a song of ascent written by David. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. I told you it was short. <laughs> In verse 1, his opening line, David says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's a good and pleasing thing uh, to us and especially to God when the brothers and sisters, quote, dwell in unity, or as the text literally translates, live together. Um, we've all read from Moses in the book of Genesis when he describes how God created everything and made it good. But there was one thing that was not good. What was it? What was that? It is not good that man should be alone. Isolation is never God's will for you. Uh, you can have your personal relationship, but you cannot get a private relationship. Uh, Eugene Peterson, he writes, God never makes private, secret salvation deals with people. His relationships with us are personal, true. Intimate, yes. But private, no. We are a family in Christ. And when we become Christians, we are among brothers and sisters in faith. 
Peterson says, no Christian is an only child. Unity is good and pleasant, but unity sticks out. Togetherness sticks out. Uh, As noted earlier, we exist in a day when everyone seems to be at each other's throat. People find excitement in competition and in division, but we put that to death with the flesh, right? That's a part of what we read on Sunday. Um, And so instead, we aim for unity, right? Not uniformity, but unity. They're different, right? We We are diverse in many different ways, but we live together as one body. David says that it's good and it's pleasant. To say it differently, our unity, our togetherness is life-giving and it's desirable. Our unity will be noticed uh, by the world around us. Jesus said that, right? Uh, Paul said that in Philippians. Peter says that. But just as our unity will be noticed, so will our lack of unity. And so we must make it our goal to be in unity with one another. But don't just think unity, think union. Don't just hold on to the image of of common direction, but also common space. That we actually live with one another as a new redeemed family. That's key, right? Uh, More on that in just a minute. But in verse 2, I just want to read it again. He says, it's like the precious oil on the head. Running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron. Running down on the collar of his robes. Uh, David describes the unity, the fellowship, the community of brothers and sisters with an image. He says it's like oil flowing down the beard of Aaron. That's an odd image, right? (laughs) What does David mean? Remember that Aaron represents the priesthood. Back in Exodus 29, God initiated the priesthood through the tribe of Levi, beginning with Aaron and his sons. And God gives this instruction to take the anointing oil and to pour it on Aaron's head and anoint him to ordain Aaron and his sons as priests for God's chosen people. David is saying when the brothers and sisters live together in unified fellowship... In a sense, we become like priests to one another. And I know that can seem controversial, especially depending on your faith origins. Um, But David is saying that we live as priests with one another in the sense that we are blessing one another with the word of God and declaring the mercy and kindness of God over each other, over our brothers and sisters. Um, Peterson writes, when we see the other as God's anointed, our relationships are profoundly affected. And then in verse 3 of Psalm 133, David said, It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. The second image that David gives for brothers and sisters who live together in unity is an image, interestingly enough, of morning dew on the mountains of Zion. Uh, for me, it's just a personal thing. Um, there's no better season than the fall, right? I've talked with many of you about this. Um, I say that for a few different reasons. Um, some are important. Most of them are not. Um, but when we reach October and I walk out the door in the earlier part of a crisp fall morning, you know, where it's just like starting to get cool, it's a little wet outside, and I, I see the morning dew on the grass and on the trees and even on the top of my car, Um, There's this overwhelming feeling of refreshment and newness, along with feelings of anticipation of the day that is coming. And that's the image that David is portraying here, that our unified fellowship brings a sense of refreshment and newness and excitement for the brothers and sisters. And then he writes, this is how he finishes the psalm, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore where has the lord commanded the blessing Uh, not the solo spiritual journeys that many attempt to take but the communal life of brothers and sisters in the fellowship of god's people 
Many have made their best attempts at describing what the eternal state will be like, what heaven will be like. And scripture certainly has a lot to say about it. But David is teaching us here that this is what, quote, life forevermore, or everlasting life will look like. This. I'm not talking about the Samsung TVs and the, and the Google lights, right? But the fellowship and the togetherness of God's people. Peterson again notes, heaven is like nothing quite so much as a good party. Assemble in your imagination all the friends you enjoy being with the most, the companions who evoke the deepest joy, your most stimulating relationships, the most delightful of shared experiences, the people with whom you feel completely alive. That is a hint at heaven. And that for us is the family of believers. It's what we want. It's what we need. A family here demonstrating in part the glories of heaven here on earth. And so we commit ourselves to unity and fellowship because Christ himself was committed to our unity and fellowship. Our unity and our fellowship begin at the cross of Christ, at his death where he reconciled us to the Father and reconciled us to one another. That's exactly what Paul the Apostle discusses in the book of Ephesians. Paul lays it all out in Ephesians chapter 2 where he writes, For he himself, that is Jesus Christ, is our peace, who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Paul is teaching us that in the death of Christ for us, he has not only reconciled God and man to each other, but also man and man. Sin caused hostility toward God and hostility toward our neighbor, right? We've all heard that. You might remember that from Pastor Holly. Sin separates us from God, but it also separates us from each other. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I haven't referenced him in a little while, he wrote a well-known book that many of us have read now entitled Life Together, where he writes, Christ became the mediator and made peace with God and among men. Without Christ, we should not know God. We could not call upon him nor come to him. But without Christ, we also would not know our brother, nor could we come to him. If that is the case, that Christ died in part to reconcile me to my brother, then I have no choice but to commit myself into the fellowship of believers. How could I neglect something that Christ died for? How could I resist the family that Christ himself established at the cross? Besides, there's so much life and glory displayed in the family of God. Or at least there should be. <laughs> the community and fellowship of believers is, uh, quote, being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 2.22. God uses the church to bring us into spiritual maturity and to walk in new life together. It's also where we experience ministry from our brothers and sisters and for our brothers and sisters. I'm going to say something that could be uh, a little controversial. Uh, it shouldn't be. And I want you to hear my heart on this, especially for those of you who are watching online tonight. And if any of you in this room or online take issue with what I say, I would be more than willing to have a conversation with you about this. Um, I'm very serious about that. And I have to be careful, mostly because of the amount of time and volunteers and even finances that we've invested into online ministry. Our live stream services and any live stream services that other churches use can be a huge, I mean incredible blessing to many who are away or feeling ill or seriously incapable of being physically in a church setting. But I would be very slow, perhaps even resistant, to the idea of calling it church. I really, I, I do believe, even after COVID, that the future church is still local. It's extremely difficult for me to build a theology or a support from scripture concerning online church. And that's not because New Testament writers didn't have an option for online church. It's because your living room and your laptop do not provide an environment for genuine fellowship with or ministry from other believers. 
It just isn't church. <laughs> and, and there's great opportunities when you're away on vacation or you're, you're feeling sick for the weekend or, or whatever. I mean, we, we love that we have this opportunity to, to, to bless our people, to bless you guys when you're out with this live stream service. But it cannot become a regular thing for us. We cannot get comfortable, even if you're a distance away. We love you. We're glad you tune in. You need to be a part of a local body wherever you're at. <laughs> and you can certainly learn scripture and hear some encouraging music, but I cannot sincerely in my heart believe that this is church. God's will for you is that you plant your feet in a local fellowship for all of those who physically can. And if you're taking a break right now because of the pandemic, I get it. I really do. Don't get comfortable. That's not what God wants for you. That's not what God wants for me. God has created us, wired us, built us to be interdependent with our brothers and sisters, speaking the words of Scripture over one another, confessing our sins to one another, practicing spirit-directed ministry together, and praying for each other. And that's for all of us, online and in this room. God is leading us uh, to a deeply woven brother and sisterhood. And our local body is, is fully functioning when everybody is fully committed, fully engaged. And we exist as a new family devoted to one another, helping each other along as we all seek to follow Jesus faithfully. If you're a part of this church, whether you're here tonight or not, if you're part of this church body, as your pastor, I'm praying that you would choose to stop putting church and community with believers at the bottom of your priority list. That you would make the decision that you're not going to just skip out on church gatherings of any kind, whether it be weekend services, prayer meeting, community group, for, for minuscule, triv trivial reasons. And you know what they are. I don't have to list them for you. Why? Why? Not because your salvation is dependent on a perfect church attendance, but because God has set his blessing on the unified fellowship of his people, a here and now experience of everlasting life. That's why. How good and pleasant is it for the brothers to live in unity? That's where the Lord um, led me tonight. And I know it was short and sweet. Um, but I, I really, this is, I just have to, and, and this is not, please online people, don't feel like the live people are here like booing you. Um, <laughs> we're so glad you tuned in. Um, but this is just, honestly, this, is, this has been on my heart. I've had some conversation with just a select few people about this. But I have to be careful because I don't want anyone to think that, that I don't value our live stream ministry. It's so important the volunteers that serve there, the finances that we have invested, the time that we've given to this is incredible, uh, a huge blessing to some, but, but it cannot be our, 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 our church home. <laughs> and so I, I think I've spoken enough tonight, but I, I would like to end with some worship this evening, um, just one more song before we close off prayer meeting. Um, before we do that, yes, we have a few things we need to pray over. Um, I'll, I'll invite you if, you, if you have anything that you need to be prayed over for, um, you're welcome to, to present that. Um, but specifically, um, someone who's very important in our church that we, we, uh, we love her so much, uh, Miss Maria Camaro. Um, as you can see, she's not here tonight. She's got a big procedure coming up tomorrow. And we just want to pray for her and, and lift up her uh, need and, and just ask that God give her some peace and some comfort, and Lord, that he gives her a quick recovery. So let's pray for Maria. Lord, wherever Maria is at right now, I pray that you would just allow your spirit to um, just be with her in the room. Lord, we pray for our sister who's been such a blessing to our church, such a blessing to me personally. Lord, I pray that your, your healing hand would be on her after this procedure, that you'd recover her quickly, that you would re renew her strength, Lord, that she would come back um, better than before this procedure. Lord, I pray that you would lift her spirits if she's feeling discouraged right now. Lord, I pray that if there's anxiety, you would give her peace. 
Lord, I pray that you would give her protection. Lord, there's also an element of this um, for provision, Lord. That she's going to be out of work for at least six weeks, Lord. I, I, I pray that, Lord, you would provide for her. And Lord, I pray that we, we're talking about this right now, the community of brothers and sisters. I pray that we, those of us watching online, those of us in this room, that you would use us as a faithful witness and help in, in serving her during this season. Lord, we're just believing with faith for greater days ahead for Maria. That the best is yet to come. Lord, that you want to, to move in her life in a great way after you've healed her and, and recovered her. But Lord, even in this time when she is down, where she's resting and at home, I pray that you would just revive her spirit. That you would encourage her with your word. That you would encourage her with, with fellowship, Lord, for home visits and things like that. And Lord, we just ask that uh, right now we can't anoint her. And we ask that, Holy Spirit, you would anoint her. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to us. For your loving kindness. Lord, thank you that you are with us and you're for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.